like everybody to think about FOIA and public records to that as well. When I think of public and FOIA records, I get documents to bulletproof every single line of my stories. There's not a single line that goes through an investigation that there isn't a corresponding document usually that like 100% verifies. And I think that's incredibly important, especially in criminal justice reporting. What can you request? Uh, documents, information, records, films, photographs, sound, recording, anything. I kind of go about it of having this thing called like a document state of mind. I, I assume that the department has everything I want until I find out otherwise. So I don't waste, I don't like tell myself, well, I'm not gonna bother asking for this because they may not have this. Well, I'm gonna go find out first if they have it and put it in. So I'm always in this document state of mind that here was the shooting, okay? What video can I get? Um, what photos there exist? What records are there out there? I'm always thinking about what actual, and I consider them, and we talk about this in, on the investigations desk, of primary source documents. Documents are like impeachable, that they support your reporting and there's nothing anyone can say about it. And so I'm always thinking about what sort of primary source documents I can get my hands on that the police department uh, or the county sheriff's has. Sometimes I ask just for, I ask for the, the flack. I was like, I just wanna see all the flax emails because I wanna see how they were told to spend this thing to the public. I wanna see the background of how this plays out. You can even actually FOIA your FOIA requests, which is like, gives you all the details of like all the conversations that have taken place, making it a decision to actually give you that information or not. And so it's something I frequently have done um, to just, an example with the Small Business Administration trying to get records um, about Ivanka Trump and they didn't want to give it out, so I FOIA'd my actual FOIA request for those records and was able to get the conversations about the back and forth of when how they were trying to decide whether or not to release it. So I know it was releasable, they were just holding it and then ultimately we ended up getting those records. And so that is something you can do um, because you can see from the top down how your request is being handled. When I say reasonably describe the records, like I get a lot of, I've gotten a lot of denials from departments and agencies say you haven't reasonably described the records you're looking for. And so when I, tell people this, I'm like, you usually, it's like you're building a map. You're t and I'm talking to the FOIA officer like they're just like a five-year-old. Like I'm gonna tell them how to get from point A to point B. And I usually do a lot of reporting on the front end to find these things out. And so I report out while I'm talking to my sources and they mention a meeting or they mention a document. I ask them, well, what's it called? How do you know it's there? Who's got it? Who's the last person who may have touched it? Like, how did you receive it? Was this like passed out in the meeting? Was it emailed out to you? So I'm reporting out all of these things so I know how to put together my request. So if somebody says, yeah, I have this report that they're not supposed to release, it was emailed out to us ahead of the meeting. I can then, now that I've reported it out, say that I'm looking for this document that's called this, that was handed out during a meeting on this day and it's called this, and I'm looking for it. And so like, there's no like ambiguity of like what I'm looking for. I have walked you, held your hand to the document I'm looking for. If I say I'm looking for a report that was produced sometime in like 2019 that may be about this, they're probably gonna say, well, we produced 300 reports in 2019. Which one are you actually looking for? And so a lot of the time while I'm doing my reporting and I'm reporting out the stories, every time someone tells me about a fact or a document or something that exists, I report out and I make them explain to me how they know it, where they got it from. And like for me to go get it, what do I need to know to get it? So I make that part of my reporting process as well and I report out a lot of uh, stories. I realized about 10, 15 years ago that Talking to journalists is all well and good, but when journalists say, I know my rights, that's usually the last sentence they will utter before hearing, turn around, put your hands behind your back, you're under arrest, if they even get that courtesy. So I started doing training with um, law enforcement, and uh, this is kind of, 
it's gonna be like the lightning round of the training that I give to journalists and the training that I do with police is exactly the same thing. And oftentimes, or most of the time, when we look at those images, think of yourselves as police officers, uh, you know, we think how heroic. People risk their lives to go out and photograph these incidents, and yet here in this country, anybody with a camera that's recording them is seen as suspect. Uh, and then, again, I could stand here and show you all of the headlines of um, settlements that cost taxpayers hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, to settle cases um, that should have never happened in the first place. When something bad's happening, first responders, the police, are always rushing to the scene, along with journalists, while everybody else is going in the opposite direction. Uh, during the pandemic, neither profession could work from home, couldn't stay home in your basement and, and police the streets or really report on things. And obviously, both professions are often highly criticized for the work that, that we do. And um, it's really something to keep in mind because now we're not, it's not only the police. I mean, that used to be my biggest headache with you can't take my picture. It's now protesters that are out there telling journalists you can't take my picture. And that's, that's a really difficult one. The one thing that I stress to both journalists and to police is you need to communicate. Do not wait until the you know what hits the fan. Have outreach. It's incumbent upon journalists to reach out to police and talk about these are the things we need, whether it's drones, which is a nice common uh, area to talk about because police agencies all want to have their own drones now. So they love talking about that. It's a great icebreaker. So you can use that if your station uh, has one. Uh, I know there have been situations where people uh, have been asked, hey, can we look at the police, or can we use your drone or the fire department to see what's going on? Uh, obviously, that's an editorial decision for you to make, but have that constant communication. Do not wait uh, until there's a riot going on to try and decide what the rules of engagement are going to be, and it needs to be ongoing. There needs to be meetings afterwards. It needs to be an ongoing dialogue. We're in the communications business, and it's so important.